Today we're going to take a closer look at the principle of stationary action. We're going to see exactly the geometrical meaning of the principle of stationary action and we're going to see that it's essentially a property of divergence-less uh, uh, fields. We're also going to see the physical assumptions that are embedded in the principle, its physical significance, and we're going to see that conceptually the assumption of deterministic and reversible evolution does all the work. The full details are in a paper, and I put the link below in the description. But here we're going to see essentially the general ideas. Here is how we're going to do it. First, we're going to see the geometrical fact that the principle of stationary action is based on. We're going to look at it by itself, even though it will not be immediately clear why the quantities that we're going to define will correspond to the variation of the action. Then we're going to go through all the details and see how they fit. We're only going to do the single degree of freedom case because uh, uh, it requires only vector calculus, which most physicists, uh, engineers, uh, and mathematicians will have seen. The generalization instead requires uh, a differential topology, requires the exterior derivative uh, and forms, uh, which is something that most uh, engineers and most physicists will not have seen. So we'll skip that. But again, the details are in the paper that is linked below. So let's start. So the best setting to understand the principle of stationary action is what is called the extended phase space, which is the standard phase space where we have a position Q and momentum P extended by time. And so in this space, we basically have the evolutions, right? At each point, we are going to go across a line that is going to tell us how the system is going to evolve in time. And so we can define at each point of phase space a displacement field that tells us the tangent of the evolution. It tells us where the states are moving in that infinitesimal direction. So we have evolution that are simply trajectories in the extended phase space with the last variable being time. So it's a trajectory in space, momentum and time. And the displacement field is the derivative in time of both position, momentum, and time. And the evolutions, geometrically, are the field lines of the displacement. They are the lines that are always tangent to the field. So if I give you the evolutions, you can get the displacement field. And if you get the displacement field, you look for the lines that are always tangents, you get the evolutions. So this is the geometrical setting. Now, once we have this, we can define the flow of this uh, displacement field. So, if we have a surface sigma, we can do the surface integral of that surface of S, and that tells us essentially how many states flow through that uh, uh, surface, right? How, how much, uh, how many evolutions go through that surface. And note that each evolution contributes to the flow if and only if it goes through the surface, right? If our surface would be tangent, right, then we would have no contribution. The S has to go through the surface. Okay, so that's the general setting. Now, we take a path, which is not necessarily an evolution. So we just take a line, gamma, in this extended phase uh, QPT, right? And this may or may not be an evolution. It's just a line in this uh, uh, setting. And we also take a variation of gamma prime, something where the initial points and the end points are the same, and we make a, a small variation of gamma. Now, between these two lines, there is going to be a surface, right? There is going to be a surface sigma. And uh, since it's a surface, we can define the flow of the evolution through that surface, and we can calculate that, and it would be a number. Now, note that if gamma is not an evolution, we can always find a variation gamma prime such that uh, sigma catches some of the flow, right? So if the line essentially is not always tangent, we can always make a variation in a direction where the flow, you know, contributes something, that it's sort of a variation that is perpendicular to, to where the flow is going. So we, we can always catch some flow we're making a variation. Now, instead, if gamma is an evolution, it's always parallel to S. And uh, surfaces in the neighborhood of gamma 
are always going to be tangent to s. So if we make a small variation gamma prime, since the, the, the variation is small, the field is still going to be approximately tangent to that surface, right? However we make that variation, it doesn't matter. We're always going to be tangent. The surface is always going to be tangent to the line and therefore tangent to the, to the vector field s. And therefore, the flow is always going to be zero. So if gamma is an evolution, an actual evolution, not just any path, there is no variation for which the flow through sigma, the surface that is between gamma and gamma prime, between the line and its variation, is different than zero. So this is the geometrical fact upon which the principle of stationary action is built. In fact, what you can find is that the flow of S through sigma, defined by gamma and its variation, right it's the opposite is minus the variation of the action the variation of the integral of the, of the lagrangian so this is what we're going to show in the next section but this is essentially the, the geometrical idea so it's a little bit uh, convoluted right so you're welcome to go back to the beginning and re-see it uh, a couple of times until you sort of see the, the, the geometrical point and then we can go and and look at at, at the details so let's step back and uh, look at the, the definition of the action of the Lagrangian, right? So we have this uh, uh, functional uh, called the action that gives a, a path, uh, it gives us some number. And this uh, a number is the integral of the Lagrangian. And uh, typically when you're introduced to Lagrangian, you're told that it's uh, the difference between uh, the kinetic uh, energy and the potential energy. And the question is, is it really that? Is it really, that, does that uh, definition actually work for everything? And the problem is that it does not. So take the Lagrangian for a charged particle. It's uh, one half mv square, which is definitely the kinetic part. There is a minus qv, which is definitely the potential part. It's the, the part that it's given you by the electric field. And then you have the part that is given by the magnetic field, that it's qv, the velocity, scalar product with the vector potential. And what is this? Is it kinetic? I mean, it looks kinetic because there is a velocity there, so it depends on the velocity. But there is also potential here. So is this a kinetic term or a potential term? This is absolutely not clear. And if you think about uh, that the Lagrangian gets extended to field theory, and so the Lagrangian will also include the energy of the electromagnetic field. Well, is the energy of the electromagnetic field a potential energy or a kinetic energy? And it would have to be a potential energy or kinetic energy of the field, right? It doesn't make much sense. So this idea that the Lagrangian is uh, just the difference of the kinetic and the potential energy actually works on very limited cases. And so it, it really does not, does not help us to understand exactly what's going on. So let's go back to the idea of, uh, of our extended phase space. Again, we have our position, our momentum, our time. We have uh, our evolutions uh, that go forward in time. And this uh, each evolution is uh, a trajectory defined as QT, PT, T. And uh, at each point, we have a displacement field that tells us where the states are going to flow in time, right? So we have this. And now we are going to assume, we are going to impose a, an assumption on this. We are going to say that the system is deterministic and reversible. And what does that mean? Well, we know what that means physically, right? We mean so that uh, for each initial condition, we have one and only one final condition. But it's a little bit more than that. So suppose that we have a closed surface here in the extended phase space, right? The idea is that states are going to flow in and they're going to flow out. And if the evolution is deterministic and reversible, well, we want that flow to be zero because we want to have as many states go in, as many states go out. That has to be a balance. So the deterministic and reversible evolution does not just, not just impose a one-to-one -to -one correspondent to initial state and final state, but imposes this flow to be zero. And this is because uh, 
uh, when we are on a continuum and we need uh, to, to count points, uh, it's not just a matter of, uh, you know, to, to look at the cardinality of the set, but we need a measure to, to see how many points do we have. And so this imposes essentially that the continuum of points that come in has the same size of the continuum of points coming out. Okay, so again, we have our, our evolution. And one of the things that is going to be uh, interesting here uh, later is that uh, the time play, play two roles. They, it takes uh, the role of a, uh, of a parameter when we put it inside the trajectory, right? So this is a parameter, but it is also a coordinate, right? Because we have it here as one of the three coordinates. So when we take the displacement field, the t above, uh, it's uh, a coordinate because it's like we have t of t, right? And the t at the bottom instead, it's uh, the t that corresponds uh, to the evolution, right? So uh, if we're going to make a total derivative of t, then it means that we're going to go along the evolution and see what happens. When we're, when we're making a partial derivative on t, instead we're going to make a change in t with q and p fixed, right? So we're going to go horizontally like this, we're not going to go along the curve. And this is useful to understand when we're actually making calculation later. But the point is that if we are imposing that uh, the flow across uh, um, closed surfaces is zero, this is equivalent to saying that the displacement field S is divergence free. And if uh, the field is divergence free, then uh, uh, there exists a vector potential theta of which uh, the, uh, the displacement field is the curve. And we're going to add this minus sign to match conventions. It's not really important. You could put this minus sign inside here. But this is what we're going to have, is that saying that uh, we have deterministic reversible evolution is equivalent to saying that the field is version 3, and it is equivalent to saying that uh, the field comes from a vector potential. OK, so how is, uh, how is that useful? Well, it's useful because we can go and see what is the expression of the vector potential. So in general, it's a, it's a vector potential. It will have three components, right? But we can fix the gauge because there is an arbitrariness on the vector potential. This is the same as the potential for the magnetic field where we can add a gradient of some function and the magnetic field doesn't change. So here, if we added the gradient of a function to theta, again, our displacement field wouldn't change. And so we use this gauge, we use this arbitrariness to set the component on the momentum to zero. So now our uh, uh, vector potential has uh, uh, two non-zero component, uh, theta q, the one uh, that, uh, that corresponds to the, uh, to the space and the one that corresponds to time. Now, the, the, the displacement field is uh, not just any field, it's a little bit particular because the time component is dt over dt. And so the time component has to be one. And this means that, uh, you know, we always need some flow in time, and the flow in time has to be homogeneous for all states. All states go forward in time at the same rate. So mathematically it means, because uh, since uh, the, the, the S is uh, the curl of uh, theta, it's going gonna, it's gonna to mean that we have this condition to satisfy. And since we've put uh, theta uh, p to zero, this part is going to be zero. And so we have the partial p of theta q is equal to one. So we integrate this condition and we can set that theta q is actually the function p. Like it takes the value p, that these components of theta q takes the value p. And so our theta in general can be expressed as p zero theta t. So the theta t, the time component, is the only arbitrary one at this point. And uh, we can just rename it to be minus h because it's convenient for later. And so we have that our uh, potential for uh, the displacement field has the form of p zero minus h. And again, there is no loss of generality, right? And we had used two conditions. One, the gauge, we fixed this. And one, the fact that the t flows, uh, the, the uh, displacement field flows homogeneously in t, and that gives us the other condition. It fixes these two components. Okay, this is kind of weird. Why is it useful? Well, 
if you now have these two expressions that s is the minus the curl of theta and theta can be expressed as this and you just do the calculation you just expand the curl you're going to derive Hamilton's equation right and uh, you know this is a, a little bit tedious you can probably stop the video and convince yourself for the calculation here is here is not very uh, interesting it's just fun to see that this actually works out but this is the idea the fact that the displacement field uh, is uh, minus the curl of something is essentially Hamilton's equation. Okay, so why does this have anything to do with uh, the principle of stationary action? And now we're going to see it. We take a path gamma, we have a variation gamma prime, and we want to calculate the flow of S through sigma. Now, first of all, because the uh, uh, flow is divergence free, it doesn't matter which surface we take, right? Because uh, it's only going to be the boundary that determines the flow of sigma. And if we didn't have a divergence uh, uh, free field, uh, the question of what is the flow uh, between a path and its variation would be ill-defined because depending on which surface you get, you would get a, a different answer. But it's going to be well-defined in our case, and it's just going to be the integral of S. And again, because of sign conventions, we need a minus sign here, and we have the minus uh, the surface integral of S over the surface, right, is equal to the integral of the curl of theta because S has a vector potential, and therefore S is minus the curl of theta. So we just do a substitution. Now here, we use the Stoke theory because we have the integral of the curl, and the integral of the curl is equal to the integral over the boundary of the vector potential. So we're just using Stokes' theorem here. And so we are going to take the integral of theta along this gamma and along minus gamma prime. And so we can break up this integral into two, two integrals, first the one along gamma and then the one along gamma prime, but which is taken with a minus sign because, again, we're going this and then we're going to go back. But this is the difference between the line integral of gamma and on gamma prime, on its variation. So this is the variation of the line integral of the vector potential theta. And now we can express the vector potential theta as P0 minus H, and we can express gamma as dQ dt, dP dt, dT dt, and we have the scalar product between these two quantities. The first term is going to be P dt, dQ dt, so P times the velocity. The second term there is a zero, so it's not there. The third term is minus h, which multiplied by dt dt, which is 1, is minus h. And lo and behold, p dq dt minus h is actually the Lagrangian. So what happens is that the flow between a path and its variation, the flow of our displacement field, is actually minus the variation of the action. And now, remember what we said before, if the path is an evolution of the system, then there is no way that we can take a variation and catch some of that flow, because we're tangent to the displacement field, so however we make a tiny variation, we're always going to be tangents, we're never going to catch that flow. But if the path is different, then we can find a variation where we catch some of the flow, and then the variation of the action is going to be non-zero. So the evolutions are those paths and only those paths for which the variation of the action is stationary. It's either minimized or maximized. Actually, there is a little extra tiny detail that I didn't mention. When you go from this expression to this expression, when you want to be able to talk about a Lagrangian, the Lagrangian has to be expressible in terms of a position, velocity, and time. And in general, we cannot do that. This is an expression of position momentum and time. We might not have a way to go from velocity to momentum and vice versa. So there is a little tiny extra assumption that Lagrangian mechanics assumes. But the interesting fact is that 
this whole derivation up to here didn't really need a Lagrangian. So the principle of stationary action exists already in Hamiltonian mechanics. We technically don't even need a Lagrangian to express it. We need the fact that the displacement field is divergenceless and we can write the Hamiltonian. So that's it. That, that's the whole thing. Now, if you generalize to arbitrary number of uh, degrees of freedom, what happens is that you need an extra assumption. You need the independence of degrees of freedom. You need that uh, the, uh, the sort of that flow factorizes along different uh, uh, degrees of freedom. And that's the part that it's uh, uh, that requires the differential uh, uh, geometry, differential topology, and that's why we can't look at it. But conceptually, it does not really add uh, much. It's still the same idea that we have uh, uh, the variation of the action is zero, means that we are, we are not able to catch uh, uh, the flow. It's, we are looking for these, uh, uh, this trajectory, these paths so that are always tangent to the field S. What is interesting also to note here is that uh, the Lagrangian itself is uh, a scalar product between displacement field, which is something physical, and a vector potential, that it's not something physical. And in fact, uh, if you've studied enough Lagrangian mechanics, you know that you do not have a unique Lagrangian for a physical system. And that corresponds to all these changes of gauges that you could have uh, for your potential. So the Lagrangian itself and the, the action itself, the number that you get, is not really physically meaningful because uh, they're not gauge invariant. There is something inside those things uh, that, it's, uh, that it's arbitrary. You've, you've fixed a gauge and it's physically arbitrary. But the variation of the action, that is physical because the variation of the action is uh, measures how much flow you have between a path and, some and its variation, and that's a physical thing that, that tells you something about the system. So I hope you enjoyed this. As I said, this took me two decades to figure out. Not that I spent two decades on this, but it's only a, a few years ago where I, I really was able to fully understand this and put it in this nice, simple language. So if you enjoyed this, please share it to other people because to my knowledge, this is not explained like this. And if you like this type of explanation where we really go to see the, uh, the mathematical detail and exactly how it maps to the physics and try to, to make a one-to-one one, one -one correspondence to this idea, then you're going to enjoy the rest of my research project and everything that you find on the channel.